let's just say you haven't shaven in, in, in a few days. And are you allowed to go out for batting practice with that? Mackenzie, it was probably what we expected, which is that Augusta Nationals uh, chairman, Fred Ridley, just didn't really want to go there. When you turn on women's sports and we're given a subpar platform to play on, that doesn't then signal to the viewer that this is an elite sport. Hi everyone, I am Mackenzie Salmon. Welcome into Sports Seriously. We are a brand new show brought to you by the USA Today Sports Network. Here we talk about more than just the stats. We're tapping into the conversations fans and reporters are having, and we're combining our insights with your fandom. We take ourselves seriously, but not too seriously. This week, my co-captain is USA Today Sports Now reporter, Annalise Bailey. How you doing? I'm good, new week, new episode, let's do it. New week, new episode, let's go. So every week we like to start the show with a new segment. We like to call three things. Three things you guys are talking about this week. So you ready to get into it? Yes. All right, first things first, our burn of the week. So you may have heard, but Jeopardy has got a new host. Maybe long-term, we don't know. His name is Mr. Aaron Rodgers. He's already making viral moments. So let's take a look. Did you come up with the correct response? Who wanted to kick that field goal? <laughs> That is a great question. Okay, so his monotone voice, I think, and just who he <laughs> and just who he is as a person from how I know Aaron Rodgers, I think this would be a great part-time job for him. Obviously, you can tell he's still a little bit salty about the whole Matt LaFleur kicking the uh, the field goal at the end of the NFC Championship game against the Bucks. But, I mean, full-time NFL player, part-time Jeopardy host, I don't mind it. I mean, hey, go Aaron. Um, I think he did fine. And he has said that he wants to do this. Like, he's ready and committed to add this gig onto his resume, which cracks me up, but hey, good for him. Hey, more power to him. Second thing, Space Jam 2 is coming. So if you haven't seen the trailer, definitely go watch it. Annalise, I'll be honest, I'm a 90s baby. I was born in 1995, so I grew up with the Michael Jordan, like OG Space Jam Looney Tunes. Watching the new trailer with LeBron, I know the whole debate of who's better in Jerry LeBron thing kind of probably triggers me a little bit. I don't really know how I feel about it. I know you're a LeBron fan though, so I won't I won't say too much, but my hot take, I'm not excited. That is a hot take. <laughs> now there is a track record of movie rate remakes that did not need to see the light of day. You're not wrong. But Mackenzie, I'm excited for this particular one. I'm a fan of all of the weird cameos. I am here for all of the cheesiness. I think it could be what we need right now. But speaking of all-stars, our third thing, our front pager this week, our Bob Nightingale, called the MLB taking the all-star game out of Georgia the most important move since integrating the sport with Jackie Robinson back in 1947. It's a powerful statement from Bob and from the league. Annalise, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, really powerful statement. For the MLB to align themselves with this form of activism, and it is activism, allows an entire new audience to become aware of human rights issues, voting issues, all these things that are happening right now in the state of Georgia. So Georgia flipped from red to blue in the 2020 election, and the effects of that will continue to impact the nation. And for MLB to be the sports league who shakes the table, is a huge deal. No, I completely agree. And, and as it pertains to the crossover of sports and politics, the Masters is this weekend. It is taking place in Georgia. We continue our conversation next block with our very own legend, Christine Brennan. Stick around for that. Welcome back to Sports Seriously. Baseball recently made a monumental move to take the All-Star Game out of Georgia to Colorado after voting legislation was passed that civil rights groups deemed oppressive to minority groups. Golf's biggest event, the Masters, is still taking place in Augusta and in the world of sports, the conversation leads into one another. We are now joined by our Christine Brennan, who is a legend in this field. She is in Augusta. So, Christine, you were at the Masters press conference uh, with Chairman Fred Ridley. Given everything that's happened with baseball this past week and now this huge event happening, taking place in Augusta, you've asked about golf's, golf's role in, in the conversation. How did that play out? Mackenzie, it was probably what we expected, which is that Augusta Nationals uh, chairman, Fred Ridley, who I know and, is, and certainly have dealt with over the years, I just didn't really want to go there. So I tried and I asked, are they for or against the law? 
and uh, the Augusta National, the club itself. And he uh, said his personal opinion and doesn't matter. Uh, the fundamental right to vote is essential and anything that disadvantages anyone is wrong. He also, um, you know, talked about the integrity of elections, which was kind of strange because I don't know that there's any question about the integrity of the recent election. But it basically was a non-answer. And that's um, that is not a surprise to me. Uh, because that's really the essence of golf, wanting to avoid social issues. And uh, Fred really, uh, I would say this, this brand, of course, Augusta National, is one of the great names in all of sports and one of the most important brands in Georgia. This law that civil rights groups say suppresses um, uh, black vote uh, in Georgia and was based on a lie because there was no, no uh, trouble with the Georgia elections. Given that opportunity, Fred, Ridley, I, I, let's just say it, Fred Ridley swung and missed. Christine, we saw what the MLB did last week with their decision to move the All-Star game from Georgia to Colorado. So what is sports' role in this current political conversation? Annalise, you know, uh, golf and, and all sports can take us to important national conversations. We've seen it over and over again over the last 20, 30 years. My goodness, going back to Billie Jean King and Muhammad Ali, Jackie Robinson even. So, uh, you know, people say get you know, politics out of sports, oh, forget it. You know, that ship has sailed. That's not happening. We are here and uh, these conversations transcend sports and, and uh, it's a, it's our culture, frankly. It's sports is such a huge part of our culture. So as we know, back in the early 90s, the National Football League dealt with the fact that Arizona did not vote for Martin Luther King Day by taking the Super Bowl away from Arizona. And the next year, Arizona uh, recognized Martin Luther King Day. So sports had a dramatic impact and a quick impact uh, in that case in Arizona. We saw it in North, in North Carolina with the NBA All-Star Game, the quote, quote bathroom bill. And uh, North Carolina, the NBA pulled the, uh, the All-Star Game a few years ago out of Charlotte and then the law was changed and there were uh, accommodations made. And then the NBA came back in. And of course the NFL has done the same with Arizona. And, and now, you know, Arizona's up again. Now we'll see if in fact, um, there's going to be pressure put, as I assume there will be, if Arizona decides to enact tougher voter suppression laws. Um, I would imagine the NFL would, would have to deal with that, at least look at it, if not act, and move a Super Bowl out of Arizona. So this conversation is here to stay, and whether inside the gates of Augusta National, where I'm speaking to you now, that isn't what, what people want to talk about here. Well, it's, it's everywhere. Now, what are the golfers in Augusta saying about all of this? Over the years, I've been very used to blank stares and no comments from most golfers, male golfers, uh, and even most female golfers on subjects of culture and race and just national interest. That has not happened here this week. Phil Mickelson talked about how important the laws in California are in his home state in terms of civil rights and human rights and that he's proud of that. Rory McIlroy, who lives in Florida, even though he's from Northern Ireland, uh, gave an impassioned uh, defense of voting and that voting should be easier, not harder. Um, we have seen uh, Cameron Champ uh, talk extensively about his work in this space and the need to have voting rights. Um, and so we've seen other golfers talk about this. And that really has surprised me because I didn't know that. And I think it shows that golf is entering the 20th century before too much 21st century goes by. I'm glad you mentioned, Christine, the uh, the repercussions of what we could see. Obviously, something on the horizon, the NFL. I, I always want to do, you know, flip side of the coin. Are there any negative repercussions that we could see from sports getting involved in this if the NFL should try to do this eventually in a few years? Because there are sports fans watching us right now who are sick of this conversation, right? They want us to stick, stick to sports. So I know it makes some people angry. I get that. Some people would rather not have these conversations, but it's been here for as long as I can think of in terms of sports. In America, and you're a sports fan, well, you're also a human being and you also potentially vote, you also have opinions. And, and that's what we're doing here. And, um, and so I'll never ever uh, stop doing it. And uh, I think the conversations are valid and important. And I think many, many millions of Americans care very much about these kinds of conversations. Well, thank you so much, Christine, for your insight. We appreciate you. Good luck with the rest of the event. Up next, I catch up with the one and only Megan Rapino. Stick around for our conversation. So, Mackenzie, not going to lie, you talked to a pretty big guest this week. 
Yes, I got the one and only Megan Rapino. We talked about some of the projects she's got going on with Smirnoff supporting black owned small businesses. We talked about her relationship with Sue Bird and of course, equitability fight for women's sports in America. So take a look. How important is this opportunity for you and Smirnoff and the sidebar partnership uh, to support a cause like this? I mean, it's really cool. I, I talk all the time um, and I try to do this in my own life of what can you do to make a difference every day, um, whether you're an individual, whether you're a brand or a company or whatever. So to be able to bring a global brand like Smirnoff together um, with a black female led business, it, it's just a really fun and creative way uh, to continue to, you know, like I said, show visibility and uh, continue to make the world a, a, just a little bit better every day. A little bit. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, I'm very curious now that uh, you and Sue have been in quarantine together. Has this been the most time you guys have actually spent together at one time? I feel like your schedules are super busy. I mean, <laughs> by an infinite number. It, it's like normally this is us like ships in the night uh, yeah. you know, passing each other. Um, I mean, that's been literally, you know, one of the only really great things about um, you know, this whole last 2020 and uh, honestly it's still leading into 2021 is being able to spend so much more time with each other, not having to travel um, nearly as much. Um, you know, we get on each other's nerves just a little bit. Uh, you know, we have our little bickers, but overall it's been uh, something that's really special. Honestly, we probably won't have this time until we're like way older and uh, far retired from all of our work. And as you know, Sue's a legend. Uh, from UConn, uh, what's it like to watch someone like Paige Beckers um, and other young female superstars emerge? Uh, you know, these kids are are so incredible. They're playing at such a high level. Um, and I think, you know, Sue and I talk about this all the time. We, we work so hard to leave the game in a better place. Um, and, and we feel like, you know, these kids coming in are just gonna completely blow the mold and, um, you know, blow the ceiling off the whole thing. Um, they'll be the ones getting, you know, the, the multi-million dollar endorsements. And um, I think we'll, we'll all be super happy uh, for them. But it's just exciting to see, uh, you know, such young talent. And honestly, just, just all the talent in the tournament being put on display like this and being able to show up and show out the way that everybody knows they can. Yeah. I'm, I'm honestly glad you brought that up because it's crazy to me that a TikTok brought light to a weight room situation with the women's NCAA basketball tournament. I'm curious what your thoughts are on uh, just social media. Do you think it's helpful in today's day and age that, you know, people have to turn to social media for that? What do you think that says about, I guess, society that we have to go to TikTok? I think so often with discrimination and with disparities, um, you know, especially in sports, it's like you don't know it until you see it and you don't, you know, we could hear that, you know, okay, there's differences in the weight room and the weight rooms look different at the tournament, but seeing one rack of dumbbells and seeing an entire, you know, friggin' LA fitness being like <laughs> erected behind, you know, it's like the visual of it, I think is really important. So I think especially uh, for social movements um, and, and for people who don't have the grips of power, whether that be, you know, the media or huge platforms, um, I think it can be an incredibly powerful tool. Did that resonate with you at all and kind of what you had to personally go through with U.S. women's soccer? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we talk all the time about, yeah, we talk about equal pay and I think the, the compensation and the salaries are, uh, you know, sort of the, the clickbait in it. But really what we talk about all the time is the funding, the resources, the allocation put towards that, whether that's branding and marketing. I mean, we've seen more than just the weight rooms at the NCAA tournament. The floor says women's basketball or like women's turn. Well, no, of course we're watching women's basketball. Everybody knows okay. this. Like, it's March Madness. Like March Madness is the branding property yeah. that everybody knows and that has value. So you are withholding value from the women's uh, mm -hmm. tournament for what? Like wh why don't you want both tournaments to succeed? All of this stuff matters. It matters the way that it looks when you turn on the TV because you know what it looks like to look professional. You know what uh, the men's tournament's looking like. You know what an NBA arena looks like. So when you turn on women's sports and we're given a subpar platform to play on, that doesn't then signal to the viewer that this is an elite sport or this is an elite team. And so it all matters. Um, you know, it's not just about the dumbbells. It's about, you know, the, the whole kind of system and how men are systemically or systematically propped up over women time and time again. 
I would do want to briefly talk about the Draymond Green tweet. So I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Uh, I know he recently posted about equal pay in the WNBA, and he essentially said it was on the WNBA and and businesses to promote exposed stars, and and kind of took took it off guys. I think Sue said it best to uh, to him. She said, "You got the problem right. You tagged the wrong people." But what I want to know is, I mean, where do you think that mindset was coming from? And ultimately, how would you identify the problem in reaching equitability? I think his mindset probably honestly was in the way that he does things and the way that that men are able to do that. Um, we are not able to believe me. I've asked. <laughs> I've asked for funding. I've asked for more salary. I've asked for, uh, you know, better accommodations. I've asked for better travel. I've asked for more stories to be told. <laughs> Believe me, I've asked for all of these things. We've all asked for all of these things. I, I think it comes, you know, from a place of not, frankly, being educated enough, of being in an entity like the NBA that's been around for 75 years. They're a fully matured business um, that, by the way, have gotten a lot of funding and resources on the ground level. Uh, you know, it's not like uh, the Bill Russells of the world were just like, hey, give us the money. Like, those, those players fought for equality and those players fought uh, for equity in the game to be able to get to this point where, yes, of course, we know LeBron's story. Um, of course, people are investing money in that. Why? But why aren't they investing in the women's game? That's really the most important question. So I think I don't think he was ill intentioned. I think he was he was very much ill informed. I would encourage him to educate himself. Uh, much more. And I would encourage him to think about it in the greater social context of, um, you know, we are out here trying. Uh, we've asked these things. That's kind of how discrimination works. <laughs> um, as with all social issues, you can't just rely on the people that are being um, oppressed, whether it's racial issues or gender issues or sexuality uh, or, or women in sports. We, we need allies and we need all people to get in the fight to start to break down so many of these discrepancies and these disparities for us. When she is not scoring goals, winning World Cups, being an icon, being an activist, I think Megan's best quality is that she just says it like it is. Oh, she she was incredibly insightful and candid. And I think uh, you can obviously tell how well she connects with people when she talks to them. And I think most importantly, uh, the awareness she brings up to issues that need to be brought to light. Changing gears, we're headed to the ballpark in our final block. Up next, we've got our very own Ralphie Aversa, who sat down with Yankees first baseman Luke Voigt. We also dive deep into Ralphie's experience at Yankee Stadium for the first time in over a year. Guys, welcome back. We are now joined by our host and producer at USA Today, Ralphie Aversa. It's baseball season, Ralphie. I know you're a huge fan. How excited are you the season's back? I am so pumped, Mackenzie and Annalise. I mean, even just having the 60-game season last year and having that simple pleasure of sitting outside, listening to the game on the radio with a cold beer, to now have that for 162 games is pretty awesome. I know you recently caught up with Yankees first baseman Luke Voigt. What's his status? All right, so uh, during spring training, a left knee injury uh, came to light uh, for Mr. Voigt, and I asked him about it during our chat, and he kind of downplayed. It turns out he had a torn meniscus, required surgery, out four to six weeks, according to manager Aaron Boone, although the surgery was successful. And that, of course, allowed Jay Bruce, who recently celebrated his 34th birthday, to make the roster. As for Luke Voigt, you know, he and I had a, a great conversation. Luke's a, a jovial guy. What you see is what you get. He's a fan favorite in the Bronx, certainly looking forward to having fans back at Yankee Stadium. We chatted about that. We also chatted about the longtime Yankee policy of their players being clean shaven. Why did we chat about that? Well, you can take a look right here. Luke teaming up with Chick Hydro. Uh, obviously, the Yankees, a long-standing policy of the players uh, being clean shaven, maybe sometimes having a mustache. Obviously, remember uh, another guy that manned first base for, for quite some time, Don Mattingly, a, a guy I watched growing up. But uh, Luke, I guess talk about first why you, you partnered here with Chick. Well, obviously, you know, obviously Yankees have a great history and, you know, obviously uh, shaving constantly. You know, I've always had razors that have had, you know, irritation in the skin and I recommend it. I shave my arms too. So it's been great on the arms as well. And uh, it's a great product. So you can get it at any uh, like CVS, Walgreens, Walmart or anything. And it's uh, great if you forget one on the road. I I'm curious, who is it? You know, let's just say you haven't shaven in, in, in a few days and you, and you got a little more than a stubble. Are you allowed to go out for batting practice with that? Or does somebody stop you beforehand and say, hey, 
grab the shake, buddy. You got to be clean shaven before you, you start taking BP swings. Well, I think some of these guys have taken a little advantage of with these masks um, and uh, <laughs> hiding some of their fish there. But you want to name names or no? Uh, I'll keep the names out. But um, <laughs> but yeah, Booney Booney will uh, play some jokes at you if you get a little bit too long. And um, but you know you got to respect the respect the pinstripes. And obviously, it, it's a pain in the butt sometimes to save all the time. But um, if you get a good razor, it's easy. And we got a couple bald guys on the team, so I recommend recommend it for them too. So. Uh, before we let you go, you, you mentioned, obviously, uh, with the team getting ready to, to come back to the Bronx and uh, starting off the season at 20 percent capacity. And, you know, you and I have talked about it before. You being such a fan favorite. Uh, what's it going to be like for you to have fans back in the Bronx? Just to be back in New York playing meaningful games. I mean, you know, teams, you know, it's harder for teams to play, obviously, with, the you know, our Yankee fans and Yankee Nation, you know, always having our back and defending us. So. I can't wait, you know, even for roll call, my first roll call, and it'll be a freaking year and a half. So uh, hopefully, you know, as the season goes, that percentage goes up and up, and, you know, we get a full capacity by playoffs. But um, you just got to stay safe and obviously do the best things possible and, uh, you know, just follow the protocols. Rafi, I'm sure you had a blast talking to Luke Boy as a Yankees fan. Uh, speaking to the 20% capacity, I know you recently had a chance to go to a game. Talk to us what that was like being back in, in the ballpark. Uh, I'm sure you had to deal with a lot of COVID protocols. Tell us what it took to get from point A to point B in the stadium. Yankee Stadium working with the city and the state, a number of COVID protocols. Uh, as far as getting into the stadium besides a ticket, you need either proof of full vaccination, a PCR test 72 hours prior, or a rapid test six hours prior. Now I have an urgent care that's only a few blocks away from my apartment here in New York City. So I went the rapid uh, test route and was able to get that prior. Once you get to the stadium, you show the negative test uh, result at the gate, along of course with your ticket, that gets you entrance into the stadium. We're in the Babe Ruth Plaza here, outside of gate six at Yankee Stadium. Normally, this would be packed. It would be tough for me to even like walk through here. You'd have lines out the door, people trying to get in, so on and so forth little easier to move around here. So lots of protocols are in place, but once you enter Yankee Stadium, what is that experience like? Well, it's certainly different, Annalise. I mean, you know, Yankee Stadium seats about 50,000, so you only have uh, a max of 10,000. I believe the uh, announced uh, attendance at some of these weekday games uh, this past week was around the 9,000 area. So right off the bat, you have socially distanced uh, pods and obviously areas throughout the concourse where people can stand to watch the game, no eating or drinking in the concourse. You have to do that in your assigned seat. I think the most poignant part of the entire experience to me was the end of the game. Some people didn't even get out of their seats. They just sat there and just kind of took in the view. And, and it got me thinking, you know, for many of these people, for a hardcore Yankee fan, the last time they were at the stadium was October of 2019 when the Yankees were in the ALCS and would eventually lose in six games to the Astros. So for them to be back over a year later with everything this country's gone through, with everything that New York City has gone through, it was a, a really cool moment. I know I personally can't wait to get back to to games in person, in stadium. But thank you again, Ralphie, so much for joining us on this week's episode of Sports Seriously. We appreciate all your insight. Thank you both. Annalise, thank you so much again for joining me as my co-captain on this week's show. It was a great episode. Next week, we got NBA star Kevin Love to join us. It's going to be a good conversation. It was a great episode. And next week's conversation is sure to be phenomenal. Kevin Love is going to be tackling mental health, which is important in the sports world, but also to society as a whole. So I'm very excited for that on the if you guys want more sports stories and coverage that go beyond the X's and O's, make sure to tune in next week. As always, I'm Mackenzie Salmon. And I'm Annalise Bailey. Take it easy, y'all. Hey, sports fans. If you want to see more videos like this, check out some of our other ones right here. And if you like what you see, make sure to hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for more from USA Today Sports.